Um, hi, my name is Lizzie Meister. I'm the Public Programs Manager here at the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience. Um, and I am so excited to welcome Glenn Hartman here with us today to have a chat, to schmooze and groove um, and talk about Southern Jewish music. Um, so the only thing I'll say in terms of Zoom housekeeping is that we ask if you have any questions, just pop it in the chat. And in the last 15 minutes, we're gonna come back to those questions. Um, and we ask everybody to stay on mute so you can best hear our conversation. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Glenn, to start talking. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, look at all these important people that are here. Uh, my name's Glenn. I'm a uh, musician and a New Orleanian and a Jew, amongst other things. Um, slightly um, disappointed Saints fan at the right at this moment. That's okay. We've, you know, sometimes we have to be reminded <laughs> of how these things are supposed to be. Um, so I'm, uh, uh, today, the, this hat that I'm wearing is as a klezmer accordion player. Um, I'm going to play some klezmer and we're gonna talk about um, klezmer and klezmer in New Orleans and klezmer in my life. Klezmer is a, uh, Yiddish instrumental music um, starts, it uh, has its origins in Eastern Europe in um, at least the, the 16th century, that would be the 1500s. Um, and we know more about what was going on with these players at the time than exactly what the music sounded like then, but um, we have a lot of writing about what they were, what they were up to which was roaming around playing music for certain Jewish events, um, primarily non-religious things, um, except on certain occasions like Simcha's Torah or the dedication of a new Torah or a new synagogue itself or circumcision weddings, of course. So I'll play you a song. Um, this is... Uh, Song is really a freilach, uh, although it's vulgar. It's um, it's, it's the kind of thing you would uh, d dance to at a at a wedding, join hands, and do what now we call the hora, right? Get the chairs out, people. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
with this side yeah, of the yeah, computer yeah. now um, to join this conversation. So my first question is, why did you choose that song? Why did I choose that song? Because I know how to play it. Um, because I saw Mark Rubin on the, as one of the guests, and I played it with Mark at the Simple Star Celebration the other day, and it made me think of it. Um, why did I choose that song? Well, it's in the key of D. A lot of klezmer tunes are in D, so it seemed appropriate to play one in D. Um, I don't know, it's a demonstration of kind of when people hear and they think klezmer, they often think of that kind of two beady thing, which is this thing. But really, um, and then at the end, I kind of gave it more of that vulgar feel and I was going to... So it has this very classic Klezmer scale, which is. So, and it's also a traditional song, you know, it's an, it's an older one. So, um, so I thought that it was a good choice. I uh, want to scare them away with the, with the weird stuff right at the beginning. Uh, bring us all in with the Klezmer <laughs> stuff before we have our conversation. Our conversation and make it a little bit more southern um yeah so my my first my first question is like how did you get your start in plasma music and then it's going to turn into how did it turn plasma in the south um well so you know i i mean i grew up um grew up reformed jewish in southern california um you know aware of what plasma was the way that um that I, you know, I danced to Simon Tov and Mazel Tov and Chava Nagila and those kinds of things. Um, but, it, but I was more aware of, um, you know, Israeli folk dances and those kinds of things I did at summer camp, you know. Um, so, but, um, so then I, I came, so really what happened was I was interested in being a rock and roll musician. Um, I came to New Orleans, I was living here playing music and some friends started, got interested in, in, um, playing, uh, Klezmer. you know, they came up, came up with a funny idea, which was like, oh, what if we had a second line Klezmer band? That'd be funny. Um, and it was people who were playing with um, Kermit Ruffins at the time. And it was Ben Shank, who is um, Panorama Jazz Band, and Jonathan Freilich and Arthur Kastler. Arthur doesn't think any longs anymore. And then um, I ran into Jonathan and, at uh, Tipitina's at two in the morning. He was like, we're starting this puzzle band. Um, I knew what it was. At the time, I was actually teaching a course of, um, called Folk Music of the World at Tulane. I was a grad student there. And um, so at least I didn't go, what's Klezmer? So I think that got me hired, but I didn't even know how to play the accordion then. I, I wanted to play, um, I was a piano player, and but I had an accordion that belonged to my father. And my father did not play Klezmer, he played um, just the, you know, Anchors Away or whatever Americana things. That's not where I learned how to play the accordion in my 50s. But, um, but that was it, and we and then we started that band, and it wasn't called the Klezmer All Stars yet. It was um, originally called Ben and the Boys after Ben Shank, and then it um, it kind of morphed. We tried a bunch of different names, and uh, other people showed up. And the reaction that we got when we played Klezmer was the reaction we wanted to get from the music that we were playing, and that kind of made us shift our repertoire to more and more Yiddish music and we learned more and more songs and um, kind of went. Do you think, like, what do you think the impact of being in New Orleans on that reaction was? Do you think people were well, familiar with it? Yeah, so this was, so we we're talking about the early 90s mm -hmm. in New Orleans. Um, and this was right when, um, so our first gigs were at Caldi's Coffee Shop on Decatur Street. So, which is also kind of an interesting thing too, because in the Klezmer revival, um, as you started to have bands that were forming, they weren't 
necessarily forming to play in for live things. It was more like people were getting interested in the music and either recording or interested in the music and then doing concerts. Mm. But we were getting interested in the music and performing in coffee shops and then primarily in bars in New Orleans. So, um, you know, people in New Orleans like to party mm -hmm. and they want to dance. And if you, as a, when you get a gig in New Orleans in a bar, particularly um, at that time in New Orleans, the gig would start late mm -hmm. and it would go very late, very late. So I'm meaning it would, it say the gig started at 10, but really you didn't start playing till 11. And if you went till two o'clock in the morning or maybe 2.30 or maybe three or maybe four, and people were still there, I mean, like really late. This was on a Tuesday night, you know, like not on. And so I'm talking about like Cafe Brazil in 1991. You know? And so people at that time, um, so what happened is we would play klezmer songs and people would invent folk dances. And we watched a whole thing, like a scene build around people creating their own kinds of movement to this music we were doing. And they had their own cultural memory that they were sticking into it, you know? Um, and I'm not talking about three people, I'm talking about, you know, 30, 40, 60, 80 people, like in two in the morning in Cafe Brazil, like inventing a folk dance together, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so that's, um, you know, so what happens then with the music is you start to play, to stretch, you have to stretch. Mm -hmm. the songs and the songs that go over well you you get a groove going and you know and, and you stretch it out and, and that's so that our music kind of evolved with the dancing which was a very new orleans thing mm -hmm. you know it wouldn't have happened somewhere else it wasn't like although there was initially this idea let's have a second line plus event we never said oh we're gonna play a second line beat and we're gonna play a prelude on top of it um that kind of evolved as the dancing with the people evolved, you know, it was, um, which is how music works, right? Music provides um, a certain kind of release for the people playing it. And then for the people listening, you know, they connect um, because there's something that makes them feel like they can let go or be themselves or, or um, express a certain kind of emotion. And Klezmer is very good at that. Um, it was always music, and then you can read about this way back in um, when you in the early in Yiddish writing, like in Shalom Aleichem stories or parrots or any of this stuff. When they start talking about klezmer, they talk about its unique ability to, you know, everyone stopped and listened to the violin player, and it sounded like the violin was speaking words, and they stopped. Everyone looked down into their laps and fiddled with what was in front of them as the know as they kind of went into their own thoughts and you know, I'm sort of paraphrasing something that I'm remembering from um, a Shalom Alechem story but you know and it's this kind of this kind of uh, thing that's reflected in the, in the cantor singing you hear a lot and they call it the cherets but it's this catch and so like oi, 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 oi. and you hear that mimicking emotional and like that or really exuberant mm -hmm. so, which is why it works so well and you played with that with with in your like long gigs or the you know yeah just all of it we just yeah we just all just i think that people um like so music survives for different reasons um and music that uh, like I'd say the human experience is not a finite experience. The human experience is an infinite experience. So 
where do we get at the infinity of, of being human? Well, sometimes could come through religion and prayer. Some people find it, some people can find it in art. Um, and in, and music is a very abstract art. And so it's, it's um, music that's good at making people feel connected to one another and to their past and um, gives them hope or whatever it is, is it survives because it's useful. It's a useful human tool. Like humans, like music is a human thing. It's humanly organized sound. That's a, you know, people say birds sing. Well, birds sing, I mean, they're, but they're not singing like, like music is what humans do. We take noise and we organize it in a certain way. And um, to communicate, interestingly, non-verbal things, like to communicate from the heart. Mm -hmm. So how do you, you know, and, and this is, so we're taking centuries old Jewish tradition filtered through, through all of it through all of the good and the bad of, of, of um, history. And these, you take these songs and then bring them into New Orleans and give them to people to play. And it's, um, you know, we're all kinds of things. You can't just be, I'm only a klezmer musician now. I'm also, like I said before, a Saints fan, but, I'm, mm -hmm. but, I'm, but uh, I'm, a, I'm a New Orleanian, I'm an American, I was born in California, I'm a Jew, I'm a man. I'm but they, you know, like all this stuff is me and, and all the memory I have and don't even, I'm not even aware of that. Mm -hmm. you know, my cultural memory and all these things. So, um, I don't know. For some reason I said that and I suddenly had, was feeling about feelings about my grandparents. Like, where did that come from? So, mm. but I truly, you know, there's this like a certain kind of way that my grandparents spoke to me. Mm -hmm. You know, which which is in inside of me emotionally. Right? Mm -hmm. So, am I conscious of that all the time? No, no, not necessarily. But sometimes, sure. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what you asked me and what I'm talking about. Well, it just reminds <laughs> me of like the, of the things that we bring forward into our into our art, whether you know, absolutely, but your your arts, you know, music. So we're bringing forward the work of our grandparents and the work of all the people who've come before us and then the people who are in this space with us when you're playing. So I imagine, though I wasn't there in the nineties, um, like that you're making something with all these people in this space. Yeah. Um, and that creates something new every time, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I think it does. But also that's the thing that, um, you know, I think that's the, like that, the live music experience, um, and, and uh, is something that we get in New Orleans. It's, the, it's one of New Orleans' great gifts um, to the people who live here. I mean, that's why you come to love and live in New Orleans, is if you love those kinds of experiences. Um, you know, I've never, I, you know, maybe I'm crazy, but I think New Orleans for live music, probably the best place in the world, you know, in terms of the variety level of playing yeah. um, like some people expect you to be able to play your instruments you mm -hmm. know, when they go to hear people play in New Orleans people who play their instruments and then the new club is fun to play because you really get to play your instrument you know? mm -hmm. um, and you do in jazz and some other things too but um, you know a lot of folk music mm -hmm. so um, but you know rock and roll is about a different kind of thing mm -hmm. When you when you talk about playing your instrument, um, do is it? I'm really curious about that difference between playing your instrument with like jazz and the slip and klezmer and that connection. I'm imagining is between you, like your physical self and your instrument, versus maybe some other rock and roll. Maybe I'm off base, but well, no. What I'm just talking about is that um, uh, is that there's a certain kind of virtuosity that comes with playing certain kinds of music and not and isn't necessarily required 
like you don't necessarily have to be a great guitar player to play punk rock. No, no offense to punk rock, and I love punk rock, but it's not known for its great guitar playing. Mm. It's known for its different things, you know, energy, social commentary, whatever it is, mm -hmm. edginess. Um, and, you know, but you can't be that kind of musician and get a job in a symphony. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. And similarly in a klezmer band, neither, you know. So yeah, and you're talking about, so let's go, if you go back historically into what the klezmer was mm -hmm. and who these people were that were originally playing it, is these were some of the best musicians at the time in Europe, mm -hmm. you know, and sitting in between this kind of uh, court. Um, lifestyle and the peasant lifestyle like they were they they were somebody who was in between because they could get dragged into um some duke's you know house to because they were so good that do you know some landowner heard about mm -hmm. him was like you got to hear this guy he was amazing and they drag him over and uh, call their friends and let the person play and then they'd be like oh you know but you know you're a jew so of course you can't <laughs> you know own your own house you know whatever it was um but uh you know and then they would go back and be with their people too they were like this they, they were very in between you know and and um and some of these and and known to be very good players mm -hmm. so um and we have riot some interesting writing about uh, people being really impressed by some klezmer musicians mm. so. that like x not expert, but like expert player. Like expert is not the right word, but virtuoso. Virtuoso. Awesome. Yeah. Virtuoso of a player. Do you see that coming forward to like um the like the US context at all? Or you know, oh absolutely. Not, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, I think that 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 the Klezmer musicians were amazing. But it but the way what we say Klezmer now, like in the like in the time of um I mean, musicians and what they get to do it changes based on where they are and what's allowed, and, uh, you know, and what else is going on. So, um, but klezmer used to be a derogatory term. Um, it would be like somebody who could only play the Jewish stuff, um, and but now it's 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 not. So it more defined the musician than it did the music they were playing. But that's. that's too much to get into, but yes, some of these players were amazing, and some totally crossed over mm -hmm. into jazz and and all of that. Mm -hmm. and jazz bands, and or then got into pit orchestras, and then became, you know, I mean, there's so, and it happened with with cantors too, mm -hmm. with cousins who became opera singers, and some of the greatest ones. You know, and so, mm -hmm. um, so. Do you see any of that like fluidity in your music as well? The, yeah, the klezmer, maybe New Orleans, maybe all the other influences you've seen in your experiences. Like, does that wait through your experience as well? I don't understand what you're asking. Like the being able to know something like your instrument and then bringing it into other spaces like the Hudson who is in the opera or- Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's it's interesting um, because so I'll give you one a really good example. Um, when so we ended up with me and Willie Green. Show you this photo, which is all in the. Uh, see it here. This is um, this is in the. Uh, if this picture is in the exhibit downstairs. That's me and Willie Green right there. And he's the, was the drummer for the Neville Brothers. So Willie Green, one of the great punk drummers ever, and he ended up playing klezmer music with us. Um, and he changed the way our music sounded by the what he brought as a African American drummer to Yiddish music. He was more concerned with the music. Of it. He didn't care if it was Jewish or not. He wanted it to sound good. He wanted it to sound funky. He wanted it to sound fun wanted to be danceable. So he 
became our drummer and the music changed, we started to have some success, we needed another drummer um, because he was busy and we got a gig at a festival outside of town. Um, we hung up a flyer in Loyal, you know, around town and we ended up getting someone came to audition. His name was Stan Moore. Now, Stan Moore, um, you might or might not know who that is, but is one of a younger, but considered one of New Orleans great drummers and a great jazz drummer and um, a lot of different styles. And he's in this band Galactic and in a whole bunch of other things. So Stan now wanted to um, imitate Willie, right? Who was playing our stuff, but also got became, was a little bit more of a student of the older Klezmer stuff and worked really hard with me and listened to the way that I was, and I would say, don't listen to the bass, listen to what I'm playing. And I'd say, listen to what I'm playing. And I'd play something like on the accordion like this. One. So Stan developed this style of playing this great press roll on the drums, the snare drum. And if you ask anyone about Stan Moore's drumming, they'll tell you that his snare drum work is really incredible. And he will tell you that it came from trying to follow me playing accordion in the Klezmer band. So um, it's so, I think that's a good thing that you're pointing out is that things don't only move in one direction. Mm -hmm. I think that even in regards to immigration to the United States, everyone assumes they're like, and the Jews, they came to the America. But there was a whole window when information was going the other way as well. And you can see it in descriptions of weddings from that time when they were dancing foxtrots, they were dancing tangos, they were doing, and the klezmer bands were in Europe. Were, was, were playing that material. And similarly, musicians would get pulled, who were not Jewish, would get pulled into klezmer bands, primarily what um, uh, Roma musicians that people would used to say gypsy, but now we say Roma, and they would get pulled into the um, into klezmer and then they would go back out. And, and, and so you're getting this this cross thing, cross thing, cross thing. And similarly, it's gonna happen here in the United States. These bands are gonna play um, and then these people are gonna go back out and then be aware of, of what's going on. And I think so what happened is when we were playing Klezmer on Frenchman Street with Jews and non-Jews in the band and Jews and non-Jews in the audience and other musicians wandering in and standing there in the room, and saying, hey, I want to sit in, and maybe it's Earl Turbin, or maybe it's Brian Blades, or these are people who then went off to do other things or play with Emily Harris or play like, I mean, it was, it, it's, uh, it, it goes both ways. And um, some of it's just an awareness. So, um, but it's very funny because like for we, the band, our band became, we thought we're called the Klezmers, and like the Klezmers, as if we were the only, one that there was, you know, um, but that is not true. So and we were not the first Klezmer band in New Orleans. Um, there was one before us that was primarily, um, I think there were some symphony players, it was called Klezmania. And um, there was a cassette tape, someone, and if you're out there with a Klezmania cassette tape, we would like to hear that. Um, and I'm not sure what would happen to those people, but they had a little, they were like a little Simcha band. So I don't know um, beyond that, what the real history of, of Klezmer bands um, was in this city. But then there was us and now there's, there's more. Um, there's more because obviously the Klezmer branched out and then started Panorama and then there's others mm -hmm. as well. But um, it's, not, it's just not so strange. But if you're talking, this is, now there's the idea of, of Eastern European bands like um, Gogol Bordello got real popular and they were, you know, and they came from Eastern Europe with that kind of, that kind of crazy energy that comes through this music, but then turned more rock and roll. So here it comes up, Beats Antique, kind of hip hop -y vibe one. Um, Paul 
can be boxed on it. But anyways. The the different experts coming together, the different virtuosos coming together and sharing something, create something cool, powerful. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and something that I would say is authentic because the thing that was authentic to the music was its energy, mm. you know, and the um, preserving that energy is what the, the folk tradition is about. Mm -hmm. Like it didn't really matter because um, if you can look at photos of klezmer bands, um, even old klezmer bands, and you're like, okay, well, originally, look, they all had uh, violins and uh, hammer dulcimer symbolums, you know, and then suddenly, well, they have some horns and um, some drums. Well, it wasn't because they weren't, they were less authentic suddenly. Mm -hmm. It's because people got their hands on horns and drums, you know, and how did they? Well, because they got drafted into the czar's army and they came home with instruments. And, um, you know, and similarly, like um, you see it in throughout all the classical music, mm -hmm. right? You know, classical music and any kind of folk music. Um, so it just makes you use what you have to produce the art that you need for the life that you're living, mm -hmm. right? I can't, and then other things have an effect too, like recording, you're like, oh, the clarinet's louder than the violin or, the piano carries more than the cymbalum. So sorry, cymbalum player, you know, we're not gonna use that. Mm -hmm. use the piano and accordion, like everyone goes, a, cl a klezmer, you need accordion. Accordion wasn't even invented until the, the early 1800s, 1840s. So like, so it couldn't have been original mm -hmm. to, um, but now you wouldn't even think of it. Mm -hmm. Or some people would, I hope you don't. Don't you go start in klezmer bands without accordions. <laughs> Uh, so you talk about the, the like goal of the music or like the, the point of the music and the point of the music is to like bring people together to make people move to feel something like what what would you say is the point like the goal of a klezmer band is there a goal singular goal no <laughs> so no the yeah. short answer is no uh the the larger answer is the goal is defined by the by the function Mm -hmm. You know, is the band being hired? To, I mean, I could talk about my class mm -hmm. Is my class red being hired to play at Jazz Fest? Or are we being hired to play at a rabbi's house for to celebrate uh, Hanukkah? Mm -hmm. Or are we being hired to, to play at um, a non Jewish wedding mm -hmm. where they want? a funky Yiddish band because they saw us at Jazz Fest and they thought it was cool and they're asking us to play a second line. We literally, we played a wedding the other day. True story. Um, great wedding. Great people. Um, and they, but they were like, could you cover these songs? We played a Wilco song. We played a uh, Neil Young song. We played a David Bowie song. Um, and, uh, you know, you some people would say, you that's so not traditional. But if you literally went back hundreds of years and you realize these musicians were getting paid to play what the people wanted, and someone would say, can you play our, my, our favorite song? It's whatever it is in Poland in let's say 1822, they would play it. There'd be no reason for them not to play it. It didn't really matter. They were, if it was from the classical repertoire, the classic, the, the klezmer repertoire, or the or the local folk music. Um, I mean, if you look at the Yiddish language, right, and or the way that Jews speak anywhere, um, like you know, this says shalom but this isn't the shalom y'all mug which is which is what i thought it was but you know if you hear you'd say shalom y'all right and so that's that's so us and yet um you know if you spoke yiddish 
closer to the east, maybe even as far east as Turkey or something, you know, you're going to have words that are in that local dialect. If you're near Italy, it's going to sound a certain way. If it's in Poland, Romania, Russia, you're going to have actually have different words in the language. So you're going to have different repertoire from those bands in those places. You're going to have different inflections in the style. You'll see it reflected in the repertoire. And similarly, like it would make sense to for for that to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, today you do what you do what you're asked to do in the moment because it defines the player more than it does the the the, the repertoire, mm -hmm. right? So what's what now that put you on the spot? What is a New Orleans dialect for Klezmer? If what would is there a New Orleans dialect? I don't know if there's a New Orleans dialect, but I could tell you. Um, so I'll play you something, and and you can see what what I what I'll do because do based on the way that I play. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, some people will be like, "You can't do that," but I don't think whatever. Mm -hmm. you know? So this is an old song. It's called um, "By I'm Revenant in Palestina at the Rabbi's House in Palestine." I'll play just a little bit of it, and. Um, You'll, I'll play it real straight and then I'll just start play, having fun with it. But... <laughs> But yes, it's all still within the context of the song, mm -hmm. and it's and it's um, you know it's driving it forward. Still, like you could still do the traditional dance mm -hmm. the whole time, but there's no. But you would know that you were not in Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So yeah. bringing the music to the place where you are. Yeah, and, and bringing yourself. Yeah, you know, bringing yourself. You know, and it's like I'm not. Some people are like, oh, it's fusion, and fusion is confusion, and blah, blah, blah. You know, we get a little bit of that. Mm. But, um, but I don't, you know, I, I would disagree. I mean, because it's, I mean, look at this, look at the, the music, Southern Jewish experience. I mean, it is, it is an experience of fusion. I mean, it, it, you know, it has to be, mm. right? And um, so I don't, um, you know, so it's it's like mm -hmm. at, there's been places in all throughout the history of um, I would probably all cultures, but here we're talking about um, Jews in particular, and where people made choices. They were like, you're like, okay, so like like let's look at in the 1700s. We're like, are we gonna go Enlightenment or are we gonna go Hasidic? You know, they like split. Like we're gonna divide. And because we want to be insulated, we don't want to assimilate. And some people say, no, we do want to assimilate. We're going to be part of society and still Jewish. And, um, you know, so we, what are we going to do? We're going to be part of the New Orleans music scene and still Jewish, right? And we're going to do what's appropriate 
on any occasion. Um, you know, we're not going to like fight, mm -hmm. fight the, uh, the experience. Mm -hmm. Because what are we doing? We're primarily artists, mm -hmm. right? Um, but, and what's, and I, the way that I look personally at my job as a, um, as a musician, um, is that I, it, it's a, it's a, the, the klezmer or the idea is a, of a klezmer is you're like ch a channel or like a conduit or something from somewhere else. So my job is to push beauty out into the world. And I don't really know, it's not for me to judge when it's important or when it's not important. Like I have, I don't get to say, more important because there's more people listening. Like, I don't really know that. I learned a lot of that from a great New Orleans musician named Tim Green, um, who was a sax player. He just really impressed me with how much energy and intention he brought um, all the time. And I learned that lesson from him straight up. He just said, not your choice. You don't get to pick when you get to try hard. Mm -hmm. And um, Tim Green um, was a great man. He was one of the founders of WRBH, the Radio for the Blind. Wow, it's cool. Yeah, very cool. Um, that idea that you're outside of yourself, like you don't get to make these decisions. Have you have you had an experience that you can like recall? And this will be my last question, and then I'm okay. going to let it hopefully go to the folks on Zoom. Okay. Um, but can you recall a time where you were just like taken by the music? Maybe not because you were taken. Um, a time when I was taken by the music. Um, wow, that's such an interesting question. I, do, I, uh, I think that, um, you know, I, I don't I don't really have an answer. Okay. For you. I, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting question. I I don't I think that there are certain uh, um, occasions when I c can recall um, beautiful musical moments um, or beautiful interactions with audience members or things. But um, I'm not pulling up some crazy story now. You know, I always love playing a jazz fest, mm -hmm. and there's good reasons for that it's because people are really there for to listen for the right reasons it's always good to when you have an audience mm -hmm. that is really receptive to what you want to do um i remember funny things you know mm. I remember funny things but like we used to go up to uh, play at this club in in richmond virginia called the hole in the wall and this is when we were really kind of early as a band and it was really like a punk rock club and um but the energy that we got going in that teeny little room with these people who were there and, and, you know, to hear, we were just playing klezmer, mm -hmm. you know, and they were reacting like, you know, we were uh, some giant rock and roll man. And the same thing used to happen when we took this band to Jacob's camp, mm -hmm. you know, and I can tell you that we would show up and to, then these kids who, um, some of them still come up to us and say, I saw you at Jacob's camp and it was incredible. And, um, and I think it, part of it was because um, we were doing something Jewish, but it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't the things that most people see, uh, see as, oh, if you're Jewish, you act like a rabbi or you act like, um, you know, you were like, no, we're Jewish and we act like rock stars. And I think that it was, it gave people a, a nice alternative. Um, and it was interesting because we were not, we didn't get into it to express our Jewish identity. I did not get into playing Jewish music to be Jewish. Mm -hmm. I got into it because it was fun music to play and we liked the reaction that we got when we played it. It was only later that I realized um, that we had become accidental ambassadors for centuries of Jewish tradition and that it was worth talking about and worth teaching about and worth um, 
doing, um, you know, worth promoting and protecting and um, sharing. That came later. Mm. Thank you, Anna, who is behind our camera. Yes. <laughs> so as we're waiting for questions to come in, and um, please feel free to share your questions in the chat with us, and we'll toss them to Glenn. But as we're preparing for that, I know you mentioned Tim Green as being an influence on your music. Are there other influences that you haven't shared yet that you'd like to talk about, either within the music or outside the music world, um, that have influenced your musical practice over the years? Um, well, I, are you talking about, um, well, so we were, we, the, we, I'm lucky because I, I have access to recordings, you know, and so I got to have access to lots of great early klezmer recordings. Um, and, um, so the klezmer greats like Naftula Brandvine or Dave Terrace or Abe Schwartz, and these guys were amazing. And then, um, and then in terms of New Orleans players, you know, uh, like oddly, like right now, I'm having so in this huge Clifton Chenier phase. Clifton Chenier was, um, you know, the king of Zydeco, and um, so I've been learning all these Clifton Chenier tunes. And so, of course, it's going to have influence on um, on my playing. So. Um, I play another song while we're waiting. Mm -hmm. Maybe no one wants to ask a question. Play <laughs> um, so here's a song that I've recently written. It's called the Detox Aura, and it's really um, like a uh, it's a blues, but um, it's a little bit psycho vibe going in some of the sections. <laughs> The detox aura is that detox, yeah. Great, great name. Detoxification. <laughs> um, uh, I, lose a juicer, cold press, eight dollars a bottle, <laughs> celery, and whatever. Oh, um, it was really cool how you talked about music as energy. Um, so looking forward, do you where do you see klezmer music going, either in New Orleans or more broadly? I think it's got at it. So it can't get any more broadly. It goes everywhere. <laughs> I, I want to, you know, I mean, I think that, I, I don't know. I think there's more Klezmer bands. I don't know. It's, where do I, I want another gig. Someone hire me and I'll bring it to you. Um, 
No, I don't. I, I think it's just is what it is. It's it's playing. It's it's going to evolve as people look. It goes up and down, right? Culture gets broader and then quieter. It's like I don't really know. Um, you know, someone asked us once. They're like, "Where do you see yourself in relation to other plasma bands?" We're like, well, "I guess south, <laughs> south." <laughs> um, but. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't, there's certainly more klezmer bands than there used to be. Like we used to, I used to think that we were young and like upstarts, you know, but that was 30 years ago. So, um, so like I did, I just, it's just a, a, like for me to look back on that time, it's like someone that, that'd be like me looking back and going at that time and going like, oh, wow, man, your band started in the 60s or something. Or, you know, and I'd be like, wow, that's a long time ago. So um, so we're, uh, we've been around a while and I think we'll just keep doing what we're doing. So, but we're gonna make a new record. So this record's available. I brought some funny stuff, which I thought was funny. It's funny that people think this is an old one. This is, a, this is us on the cover of Offbeat way back in the 90s. And that's Willie Green and Stan Moore and um, Rick Perlis and Ben Elman. So Ben and Stanton are, are both in Galactic. They now own Tipitinas. Uh, Rob Wagner, great corona player. Kevin O'Day, um, David Sobel, all great New Orleans. Jonathan Freilich, and Willie Green. Look at that. But, you know, just like to that kind of thing. And we did just like, we still, we just won the Big Easy Award again for, for um, the last year for best world music or, it's funny because we won best, it's like best reggae slash world music. So sorry, <laughs> reggae bands, we didn't, no offense, Ben Hunter. <laughs> um, but, you know, so it's like, to me, it's a, like we were talking a little bit, um, Lucy and I before about, are we, am I surprised? And I would say, sure, I'm surprised. Like if I, um, like if I told my grandpa or my great grandfather, even my great great grandfather, one day I'm going to be winning awards in New Orleans for playing Jewish music, they'd be like, "What? That sounds crazy!" Or on the cover of the Offbeat, right? As a as a klezmer man, um, you know. And so, you know, is it a triumph for? For Jewish culture, I don't, you know, I don't know. I think it's a, it's a triumph for New Orleans, you know, because of the true assimilation, you know, the, the real acceptance, the, the, the not, um, you know. And so, but for Klezmer, you know, it just is what it is. You know, we're just doing our thing, and it's gone up and down based on what people. So, I, don't know. I know um, Lizzie might have some closing questions. I'm sure we'd love a song to play us out, but um, where can people find you? Any upcoming gigs or records or websites? <laughs> um, so the, our website is klezmerallstars.com. Um, and you can find us also on the Facebook and on the, the Instagram. Um, I think it's not going to be hard to search New Orleans Plus More All Stars, but um, and then our upcoming gigs are um, we're playing at Tulane University on their Music at Midday concert series, and um, so they have great Tulane has great concert series in general, and um, and they do these free Wednesday concerts, Music at Midday, with wonderful classical music, but they're expanding it to include more folk music and things. And so we're doing one um, towards the end of November. I wish I could give you the exact date, um, but I don't remember it in my brain, but it's a Wednesday towards the end of November, like getting towards Hanukkah. Um, and that'll be with a full band and that'll be kind of fun and it'll be free. Can't argue with that. Um, and what else? I know we have some other gigs. We're playing a wedding. <laughs> but you can't come <laughs> if you show up at Barracuda Taco Place on Chapatulas on November 6th. <laughs> you might be able to get a free taco if you pretend you're going to a wedding. Um, 
but I like like that. How weird is that? So we're playing a wedding where we're asked to play a horror, lead a second line that ends with tacos at right. <laughs> so it's very, which is not. I mean, tacos aren't New Orleans either, right? So it's the fusion that you were talking about earlier. I was talking about we're allowed to have tacos. Mm -hmm. Um. Anna took my last question. Where can where can we find you? Oh yeah, well that's on the internet. We, you know we what that's we have gigs canceled every day, so we had you would be able to see us at the Jazz Fest next weekend, but you won't because it's canceled. Mm -hmm. So um, and you would be able to see us at Bonds on a Saturday night, which is crazy New Orleans, but it's canceled. And you would be able to see us on a monthly at Carnival, but it's canceled. <laughs> so. So I'm trying to think of where our next uh -huh. uh, bar gig is or something like that. Soon, hopefully. Soon. <laughs> so I'll play, I'll, play, I'll play a pretty one to end. Here's one that I wrote, um, which is called Coney Island Whitefish. <laughs> If you have time for one question, one just came through, oh, yes. you're fine. So first of all, both Mark Rubin and Golan Moskovitz, thank you for the talk. Um, oh. And Golan specifically asks, um, since you mentioned records, what's the recording industry like for Klesmo music right now? Um, it's The recording mu industry is non-existent for almost all the music right now, is the, is the sad question, is the sad real answer. Um, so for Klezmer, you know, it's everyone's self-releasing. Um, so unless you were to do a very project-specific um, recording that a certain label that does that kind of thing would want. So what does that mean? That would be like, um, like one of the few labels that's left that might do very, um, like if we were to do, a record of someone else's music that someone might think was important, like the Klezmatics did one with Woody Guthrie's record songs recently, or something like that. That's very specific to a market that somebody thinks people would want. But um, but we really rode the end of of the of the recording industry. We were uh, um, we had a record deal with signed a Shanaki Records out of New York. And um, they gave us money to promote us as a band, and that that allowed us to go out and tour 
and really tour like uh, like uh, like bands used to do um, when they didn't couldn't didn't make a lot of money. And um, that happened. There's a whole reason why all that happened with marketing and tour support. But the, but it, but it's like it all happened because record stores existed. So with the with the dying of record stores, like I'll give you just a little like a little economics of how the thing used to work. If you had a label and you had you put out records, there were people record stores that trusted record labels and they would purchase a certain number of albums just because they knew that they liked that label. So you'd be like, we coming out with a new record, we're gonna take five of them. Now, okay, let's say that was a store in every city in the country, okay? That's a lot of records, okay? But then, now that's not happening. And then people would do the same thing. They would go to record stores and go, oh, it's a new Shanaki release. Oh, I like that label. Oh, world music, da, 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 da. You know, like it just was a thing that used to happen in a different way. Um, so it was like this, this commerce occurred that didn't happen. Um, you know, uh, that doesn't happen anymore. So these days it's all just like, almost like direct marketing, you know? Um, so if I went to like a label and I said, you know, oh, the PJ library, for example, is putting out, is, is gonna pre-buy 10,000 of my things to send into children's homes. But, you know, can you fund this label? You know, like a label might say, oh, it's the money here. We're gonna do it, you know, I know I'm gonna be, two dollars on ten thousand thing whatever it was so just it doesn't it's kind of backwards it's just very little of that going on especially with folk music you still could get signed to a pop record deal i think but i'm not my world but for klezmer recording i mean sheesh i would ask i mean go on what's the market for uh, academic um <laughs> articles these days <laughs> in terms of publishing deals <laughs> you'd be like yeah not so much. Um, it's just, so maybe someone from pj library's on we've got a klezmer for kids album out they so, probably you know. someone already did it they already, <laughs> they already did that one. we're too edgy we're, we're always we're always like we sit in between you're too jewish you're not jewish enough you're too edgy you're not edgy enough you're just right in the middle so i'm too old i'm too young so. Great, thank you. Thank you. Come to the museum. It's a really a worthwhile and uh, uh, extraordinary place. Thank you. Um, we really appreciate you having you coming here today and talking with us. Um, and yeah, really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you all for joining us. Um, and yeah, Glenn's right. Come to the museum, but also come to Glenn's gigs when they happen again. <laughs> yeah, please do. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Bye.